Marcos Cruzigno and Darmesh Jain. And most of, most of these people are here at this workshop, so we can uh, talk more with them. And uh, so the, to give some very general background, uh, I'm going to be studying partition functions for supersymmetric quantum field theories in various dimensions. Uh, and these have very interesting uh, physical and mathematical properties. Uh, I think the most striking of these are dualities. Many of them exhibit non-trivial dualities, such as 3D mirror symmetry, cyberglick dualities, uh, S-duality for 4D n equals 2 theories. And then, of course, there are many interesting uh, examples of uh, holographic or ADS-CFT dualities involving these theories. Um, so many of them, and, and these, these dualities can be understood in terms of the coupling limits of Stringer M theory on some system of brains or some singular geometries. Uh, and also from this perspective, we can understand many relationships between uh, quantum field theories in different dimensions. So even if you're only interested in, say, four dimensions, uh, it's often very useful to consider theories in higher or lower dimensions as well. Um, however, I think the most interesting behavior occurs in theories which are strongly coupled. Uh, and uh, these are very interesting, but they're also very difficult to study directly. Uh, so we need some tools uh, using, super, and supersymmetry gives us many tools. So one of these, uh, which I'll be talking about today, are supersymmetric partition functions. Uh, so to give some, uh, again, very uh, general background, uh, these are computed by supersymmetric localization. We localize, to take a, a particular example of the S3 partition function, we localize this by uh, this infinite dimensional path integral to some finite dimensional matrix model with a classical uh, and one loop contribution. Um, and this is, uh, various interesting applications. For example, it computes the free energy, which is monotonically decreasing under RG flow. It admits a continuous family of squashing deformations with a metric parametrized by a variable B, uh, so-called squash sphere, or S3B, and this will uh, also play a role in the second part of this talk. And finally, it leads to, because we have these exact results in terms of a, a more easily computable matrix model, uh, we can often solve these at large n and, and perform precision tests of holography. So there have been, in addition to S3, many other examples that have been studied in the literature. So I've listed a few here. So there have been spheres in various dimensions from 1 to 5. There have been supersymmetric indices, which is a sphere across uh, S1. Um, there have been lens spaces and lens space indices. And more recently, uh, topological indices, uh, which Jim talked about in his talk, on sigma g times the torus of various dimensions, and many others. Uh, so there have been many nice results found on all of these manifolds, uh, but I think there is some shortcoming in, 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 this, in this story, which is that uh, essentially all of these computations are independent. And in addition, all, there are many more backgrounds in principle that can be computed, many more supersymmetric observables than have so far been computed. And, and these two points are related because each computation is sort of, uh, we have to start from scratch. But there, there should be an easier way. There should be a way to make our life easier using the locality of quantum field theory. Namely, we should be able to take some complicated manifold and chop it up into simpler pieces, associate some observable to each of these pieces, and glue them together in arbitrarily complicated ways to build complicated topologies and complicated geometries from some simple set of building blocks. So the idea will be now to, to construct all of these, uh, many of these spaces and, 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 and new spaces uh, in terms of some simple building blocks. And really, we should think of these building blocks as the basic observables, and these partition functions as some derived object from those. So the approach I'm going to take in this talk is, is something that I'll call the higher dimensional A model. And the idea is basically to take these partition functions, which I should stress are not topological. Uh, for example, the S3B partition function depends on this geometric squashing parameter. Um, but nevertheless, they often can be understood in, in terms of some underlying two-dimensional topological quantum field theory. So the idea is we take some higher dimensional theory, compactify uh, D minus two dimensions on some compact, compact manifold, and this can be equivalently described by some two-dimensional theory with infinitely many fields coming from the various KK modes. And then if we, we can take this 2D theory and perform a full topological twist, the so-called A-twist, and obtain a, a partition function on a compact manifold sigma G, a Riemann surface. And then this, applying this to this theory here will, will effectively give us the sigma G times MD minus two partition function for the higher dimensional theory. So this gives us a way to build partition functions in higher dimensions. And moreover, it's, it's often possible within this perspective to insert uh, geometry changing operators. So these are operators in the TQFT, which have the effect of changing the way 
uh, changing this from a trivial product to some kind of non-trivial vibration. And in this way, we can often obtain more, more complicated and interesting uh, d-dimensional manifolds that are all described in terms of some underlying 2D TQFT. So the outline for the rest of the talk, so I'll start by giving some general background on the 2D, on the higher dimensional A model. I'll start by describing some 2D background that will then uplift to higher dimensions. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly review the 3D and 4D version uh, of, this, of this story and give a few applications. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll describe a computation in 5D, so I'll be slowly moving up in dimension, uh, on S3 times sigma G. I'll give, derive this partition function. I'll talk a little bit about the large and limit and some holographic interpretation, and then I'll talk about applications to six-dimensional theories. Okay. So let's start in two dimensions. So if we have a 2D theory uh, with n equals 2 comma 2 supersymmetry, so two left-moving and two right-moving supercharges, uh, this has some special short multiplets, the chiral and twisted chiral superfields, whose bottom components obey these shortening conditions. And these are very useful for various purposes. For example, we can uh, consider the OPE of these operators, and these are closed up to some Q exact terms and finite, and, and define for us a finite dimensional ring called the chiral or twisted chiral ring. Um, moreover, for, for appropriate 2D theories with a discrete set of vacua, uh, we, can, uh, we can consider these vacua uh, in a one-to-one -one correspondence with these chiral operators by considering the partition function uh, on a disk, which prepare, uh, inserting this operator uh, on this disk prepares a vacuum state. So we get a, a state operator correspondence between the, the supersymmetric vacua and these chiral or twisted chiral operators. Another uh, observable we can associate to these theories are, is, the, is, is through the to topological twist. So this is a, a very old idea where we define a modified action of the, of the uh, in this case, U1 rotation symmetry by mixing with the U1 R symmetry. And the uh, stress energy tensor becomes Q exact. So this effectively has, um, uh, is turning on a non-zero uh, flux, or magnetic flux for the R symmetry on these, on these spaces. And using this, this way of coupling the theories to curvature, we can define uh, partition functions on general compact Riemann surfaces, sigma g. So I'm gonna focus on the, the A model, which is a particular choice of, of this twist. So this is gonna be what's naturally going to uplift the higher dimensions. And in the A model, the natural operators are the twisted chiral operators, as opposed to the chiral operators. And so the observables in this A model are, uh, in general, correlation functions of twisted chiral operators on a Riemann surface, on a higher genus Riemann surface. And, but this, this correlation function, just using the topological invariance, we can argue that it has to have a very simple form. Namely, we can first of all uh, deform this higher genus Riemann surface to a torus with any additional handles essentially glued at a point and so implemented by some local operator, which I'll call H, the handle gluing operator. Now that we have a partition function on a torus, we can interpret it as a trace over the space of vacua of the theory by this state operator correspondence. And we, and we can now uh, consider the, this trace because these operators all commute with each other because we can just move them past each other on the torus. We can pass to a, a, a basis where they're all simultaneously diagonalized. And then we just have a sum of some contribution from these various operators, including the handle gluing operator, over some set of, uh, some basis of the set of vacua. So this part correlation function has this very simple form in general, which we'll see uh, throughout this talk. And for example, if we have a Landau-Ginsberg theory, uh, then this, this handle gluing operator is just given by the determinant of the Hessian of the superpotential. Okay, so that was the 2D story, but now we want to lift this up to higher dimensions. And the idea is that, as I described in the introduction, we're going to compactify uh, some of the extra dimensions on some compact manifold and leave two uh, non-compact directions on which we have an effective n equals two comma two uh, supersymmetric theory. So some examples, we could take a 3D n equals two theory on R2 times S1, uh, 4D n equals one theory on R2 times the torus, or uh, 5dn equals one theory on R2 times an appropriate three manifold. And I'll give an example in the second part of the talk. And Nekrasov and Shadashvili uh, studied some of these examples, and what they showed is that for many interesting uh, gauge theories in higher dimensions, when we place them on these, on these geometries and, and consider the effective 2D theory, the vacuum equations for this 2D theory coincide with the beta equations for certain integrable systems. 
And so in this way, we get a nice correspondence between higher dimensional gauge theories and uh, integral systems called the gauge beta correspondence. Uh, in addition to the vacuum, the, the vacuum of the theory, we can also study the twisted chiral ring. And now, uh, while in two dimensions, the twisted chiral operators were local operators, in these higher dimensional setups, it turns out that to preserve supersymmetry, these operators have to wrap the extra dimensions. So for example, if we consider the th a 3D theory on R2 times S1, these are line operators, for example, Wilson loop operators, which sit at a point on the R2 and wind the extra circle. And so this twisted chiral ring that we compute in 2D is, is really telling us about the fusion algebra of these line operators or in higher dimension surface operators. And finally, the other natural thing we can uplift from two dimensions is this A-twisted partition function. So if we take these effective 2D theories, compute their A-twisted partition function on sigma g, this gives us the partition function on md minus two times sigma g of the higher dimensional theory. Okay, so in more detail, the way that this computation is done is to use the effect of an effective low energy description of these 2D theories. And you can think of this as being very analogous to the low energy solution of 4DN equals two theories by Seiberg and Witten. And in particular, this low, energy, this low energy theory is controlled by a single function called the twisted superpotential, uh, which is a function of the twisted chiral uh, field strength. So this is a, mul a twisted chiral multiplet constructed out of the, the vector field. And its bottom component is the complex scalar in the vector multiplet. And so the action can be written uh, up to some Q exact terms, in terms of, entirely in terms of this twisted superpotential. So once we know this twisted superpotential, we can now compute, for example, the vacuum of the theory are given by the critical points of this modulo some branch cut ambiguities. And this equation, this vacuum equation, uh, as I said, is what coincides with the beta equation for many integrable systems. The other thing we can compute from this W is the twisted chiral ring, uh, which is generated by polynomials in sigma modulo, the relation is generated by these vacuum equations. And as I said before, this is, tells us about the algebra of surface operators. So explicitly, this twisted superpotential is computed as follows. So we can start with the 2D theory and a single massive chiral multiplet at a generic point on the Coulomb branch, a, a charged chiral multiplet becomes massive and can be integrated out and generates this uh, twisted superpotential, which is exact at one loop. So this tells us how to build the superpotential in 2D. To get the higher dimensional versions, all we need to do is sum over the contributions from the KK modes. So for example, in 3D, we have this uh, sum over KK modes, which have an effective mass uh, N over R. And performing this infinite sum, we find a dialogarithm. And similarly, in a 4D theory compactified on the torus, we have now a double sum, yes? Yeah, so this sum is, is divergent, so it needs some regularization and there's some ambiguity in the regularization which amounts to a choice of uh, Chern-Simons term that you, that you need to add to uh, regularize the chiral multiplet. So this here I've used a, a specific choice of Chern-Simons term which is the, called the U1 1 half quantization because there's a single fermion in the chiral multiplet so the Chern-Simons term has, uh, is quantized in, as a half integer. But there's other choices you can make here. And in 4D, uh, there's an essentially unique regularization uh, which gives the elliptic dialog of them, which depends now on the complex structure tau of the torus. And is given by an integral of the log of a Jacobi theta function. So from these basic building blocks for the chiral multiplets in the theory, we can build up the, gen the twisted superpotential for a general 3D or 4D gauge theory. Uh, so the expression is given here. So here I've decomposed this gauge field sigma into uh, components in the, for the dynamical gauge field and for the background flavor symmetry gauge fields, uh, which effectively act as masses in the theory. And so as, a function, as we sum over the representations of all the chiral multiplets and of, of these functions above, and in addition, we can sometimes have some classical contribution. So for example, in 3D, the Chern-Simons term uh, gives us this quadratic classical contribution. So this gives us the twisted superpotential W. Um, so as I said before, we can use this to compute, to, to find the vacuum of the theory or to construct a twisted chiral ring. Uh, but let me talk about the partition functions, these higher dimensional A-twist partition functions. So we can consider, so these were considered by these people and they 
we, they're given by this expression, so this has the same form that I argued earlier, and just general, and general grounds, that you, based on this being a 2D TQFT. So it's given by a sum over a set of vacua. So this is the vacuum equation I wrote earlier. And at each of these vacua, we evaluate these two functions. So this is an, a function here called the flux operator. So this inserts one unit of magnetic flux for a background flavor symmetry. And this is the handle gluing operator. And you can see it's again given by the determinant of the Hessian of W uh, with an additional piece called the effective dilaton, which can be computed explicitly. And this, this uh, formula can be derived just by studying this, uh, this low energy effective theory with this, this action. This gives us the partition function on these spaces sigma g times a circle or a torus. Uh, and we can go a little further so we can consider uh, introducing flux for the U1KK symmetry. So by this U1KK symmetry, I mean the following. So if we have a 3D or 4D theory on R2 times a torus, uh, thinking of this as a 2D theory from a, from a 2D point of view, this has some privileged global symmetries which are translations along the various S1 factors. So these are just global symmetries from the 2D point of view. And so we can insert fluxes for them, just as we did for any uh, global symmetry by this formula. Uh, and in this case, the effect of these fluxes is, to, is that the S1, or the torus, is now non-trivially fibered over the Riemann surface. So in this way, we get non-trivial uh, S1 bundles over a Riemann surface, and so more general topologies. And it's implemented by this operator called the fibering operator, um, which can be written explicitly in terms of the twisted superpotential. And this, form, this uh, fibering operator gives us a new perspective on many known partition functions. For example, S3 is a, uh, is a uh, S1 fiber bundle over S2. So it's a degree one uh, uh, S1 bundle over the genus zero Riemann surface. So from this formula here, I, I have a, a factor of h to the minus one, and then I have one insertion of this fibering operator f. And so this gives us the formula for the S3 partition function as a sum over, as, a, as an observable in some 2D TQFT. So this gives a new formula for this S3 partition function. But of course we can now consider arbitrary fibrations and so this gives us many new partition functions. And we can actually generalize this much further to arbitrary cipher manifolds which are uh, S1 bundles over an orbifold Riemann surface which is a, a much larger class of manifolds than the ones I've talked about here. And I will refer you to Cyril's talk later in the week. Uh, for more about that. So let me just mention briefly a few applications. Uh, so one natural thing to, to use these partition functions for is checking or studying supersymmetric dualities. And the way these dualities manifest themselves at the level of this higher dimensional A model is that we should be able to find, we can construct a set of vacua for these two theories, two theories which are believed to be dual. And these vacua should be in one-to-one -one correspondence. So we can find an isomorphism between them, which I'll call the duality map. And this should have the property that if we evaluate the twisted superpotential at dual vacua, the results should agree. And if we check that, then that automatically implies from the formulas on this page that all of these partition functions that we compute here will automatically agree, because they're all built out of this, the Ws for these two theories. So rather than check all these, these partition functions independently, we just need to check this, this finite set of relations and and this gives uh, the same information. So let me mention a, one example in four dimensions. So we can take 4D uh, QCD, uh, n equals one QCD, with gauge group SUN. And from the formulas I wrote earlier, we can write down the vacuum equation for this theory. So it's given by this ratio of, uh, of uh, Jacobi theta functions as a function of the gauge variables UA and the, the flavor parameters for the SUNF symmetry uh, nu J. And we also have to impose that the trace vanishes. And so these equations are, can be, are difficult to solve, but we can at least count the solutions. And we find that the solutions, uh, the number of solutions is given by this formula, nf minus two choose nc minus one. And this has a few nice properties. So we can think of this as the Witten index for this theory. And first of all, you can see immediately that it's invariant under Seiberg duality, where su nc is mapped to su nf minus nc just by a symmetry of the binomial coefficients. Uh, 
And it also exhibits supersymmetry breaking. So if this theory has no supersymmetric vacua, one NF is less than NC plus one, which is as we expect. So this formula seems to make sense. And a much more powerful check of this duality is to construct the duality map between these sets of vacua. And we can construct that map. And then this identity here uh, corresponds to this identity I've written in terms of the elliptic dialogarithms. So this is some non-trivial identity, which as far as I know was not known. And we check this numerically and it seems to be true and it implies the matching of uh, an infinite set of 4D partition functions for these cyber dual theories, including the supersymmetric index. Okay, so another application, which I'll briefly mention, is to take the large end limit of this partition function. So this was first studied by Benini, Herstoff, and Zaffaroni. Uh, they looked at the S2 times S1, or more generally, sigma G times S1 partition function uh, in the large end limit. And what they argued essentially was that, so for finite n, we expect to, a contribution from all of these beta vacua, but in the large end limit, there's essentially one vacuum which is dominant. And so this sum simplifies to just this simple factorization into a contribution from the fluxes in the handle gluing operator. And so for the ABJM theory on sigma G times S1, uh, they found this explicit result, which for the log for the, the entropy or the log of the partition function, which is just linear in these fluxes. And they then matched this to a class of magnetically charged black hole solutions in n equals two gauge supergravity and found that to leading order in n, this precisely agrees with the area of the horizon of these, of these dual solutions. This is a nice check of ADS CFD and of the microscopic uh, counting of the states in a black hole. So this can be extended to more general theories as, as uh, Jim talked about in his talk earlier, if including ADS5, CFT4, and black holes and black strings. And also we can consider in three dimensions the holographic dual of a more general set of three manifolds where the S1 is non-trivially fibered over sigma G. And this was work with Chiara Toto and she'll talk about this later in the week. Okay, so that was the first part of the talk. Um, so now I'll move on to up to five dimensions and talk about a so work in progress on the S3B times sigma G partition function. So are there any questions about three and four dimensions? Yeah. So arbitrary That what is true? This statement is, is, is certainly true for any n. This is what was, this is just the partition function on sigma g times s1, and it was, this formula was derived by localization. Um, this formula is, is not true for finite n. So this, this, the, this is only true in the strict large n limit, and at, even at lower orders in n, I, I would expect that there's contributions from more vacua. And so you'll have to uh, understand the contributions from other terms in this sum. So this, this is general, but this, this factorization is only in the large end limit. Okay, so we give some brief background on 5D. So in 5D, we can construct n equals one gauge theory of Lagrangians in terms of a, a cubic free potential. So the classical Lagrangian can be written as this quadratic contribution, which gives rise to a Yang-Mills term and a cubic contribution which gives rise to a five-dimensional Chern-Simons term. And here this parameter gamma is a combination of the theta parameter and the 5D gauge coupling. And in addition, we have a choice of hypermultiplets and some representation of G. So these gauge theories are IR trivial. So in that sense, they're not interesting, but the interesting uh, use of them is that they can be obtained by a relevant deformation from some non-trivial UV CFTs. So we can try to use these gauge theories to understand these, these UV CFTs. And in, many, in some examples, it's believed that the natural UV completion is not in terms of a 5D CFT, but in terms of a 6D CFT uh, with an emergent S1 direction. And I'll mention some examples later on. And so to study these theories, we're gonna compute an observable, um, the S3B times sigma G partition function, where this is the usual uh, squash sphere background that I mentioned earlier. And the strategy, as earlier in the talk, is going to be to reduce to an effective 2D theory 
and find this T TQFT that controls this partition function. Okay, so let's start by placing some 5dn equals 1 theory on S3b times R2. And the, the net, this background in S3b preserves four supercharges in 2d and gives us an effective 2 comma 2 theory in on the R2. So for example, we can consider a 5dn equals 1 hypermultiplet and the modes of this hypermultiplet contribute some long multiplets and short multiplets. We expect the long multiplets to drop out, so we focus on the short multiplets. And these have some twisted masses which we can read off. Uh, in terms of the KK momenta on S3. So we're given by this formula in terms of the squashing parameter uh, B. So as before, we just, we sum up over all these KK modes and we get some function after regularizing this, this sum, which is called GB, uh, which is uh, written most, uh, most easily in, by considering its exponentiated derivative, which is related to the double sign function which is given by this infinite product and is um, uh, the partition function of, the, of an S3, uh, of a, of a three-dimensional chiral multiplet on S3b. Uh, so for example, we can explicitly write at, at b equals one, we can write this function in terms of trilogarithm and dilogarithm and some cubic piece. So this is the, the twisted superpotential of a single hypermultiplet. Okay, so we can also uh, derive the contribution from an n equals one vector multiplet. So this now has a non-trivial contribution. In lower dimensions, the contribution was trivial. And is again given in terms of this function GB by a sum over the roots of the Lie algebra. And finally, we can have a classical contribution which comes from the Yang-Mills term and the 5 d turn simons term. And it's given by this uh, cubic polynomial, again in the gauge parameter U. So just as before, this leads us to conjecture that the twisted superpotential, which should control the, the low energy theory of this, of this 5D theory compactified on S3, is given by this expression. However, I should stress that everything we've done so far is perturbative. We've done a one loop comp calculation in the classical contribution. Uh, so just to be careful, let me call this the perturbative twisted superpotential. Okay, so let's go forward and ignore the possibility of instantons for a moment. And so we, we, everything we did earlier, we just repeat here. So we write the vacuum equations uh, and derived from this twisted superpotential. And these give us a product of double sign, fun of double sign functions, depending on the representation of, of, of the hypermultiplets. And this equation, which is not so easy to solve, has an infinite set of solutions. And the partition function should then be given by a sum over these solutions of this flux operators for the flux we insert on sigma g and handle gluing operators as before, given by exactly the same formulas in terms of this new twisted superpotential. Now it turns out we can equivalently write this partition function in terms of an integral formula uh, where we have the same ingredients uh, that appear up here, but we're now we're integrating over a contour in this u-plane, uh, the Jeffrey Kirwan contour, and we also have a sum over fluxes on sigma g for the gauge symmetry. And this formula can be argued uh, just algebraically to be equivalent to this formula. So these two are the same. Uh, but this also can be derived by an alternative procedure, which is we can start with the 5D theory and instead first reduce on, on sigma g. When we reduce on sigma g, we find some effective modes uh, on S3b for each flux sector, for each choice of gauge fluxes on sigma g. And so this can be interpreted as the partition function of a direct sum of 3D theories that you obtain by reduction on sigma g. And indeed, this, these contributions here all involve double sign functions and can be recognized as the partition function of a 3D theory. So this gives an equivalent perspective, perspective on this partition function. Okay, but we should be more careful uh, about the possibility that we miss some instanton contributions. And indeed, uh, one way to attack this is to instead of reducing the theory to two dimensions, to first reduce the theory to four dimensions, to an effective 4dn equals two theory. And if we focus on the case of genus zero, uh, so now this, is, this S3v times S2 can be thought of as a fibra, an, uh, hop fiber vibration over S2 times S2, where again we insert flux for this KK symmetry on one of the S2 factors. And this S2 times S2 partition function was computed by 
1A at all uh, by equivariant localization. And their result, which has which does in fact have contributions from instantons, which sit at the fixed points of the U1 times U1 symmetry acting on this S2 times S2. So we find by this method, uplifting their results to 5D, we find a, a, a partition function that looks very similar, where this perturbative piece is essentially what we had here, but with an additional contribution from instantons. And we can again write this uh, in terms of a twisted superpotential uh, in this kind of a way, but now there's an additional contribution from instantons. So we can write W as this perturbative piece we wrote earlier, but with an additional instanton contribution. So somehow this naive KK reduction that we did earlier is missing these instanton contributions. So these instanton contributions are difficult to study. Um, so for the rest of the talk, what I'm going to do is focus on limits, some certain simplifying limits where the, we expect these instantons to drop out and where we can get by just using this perturbative twisted superpotential that I wrote earlier. And we'll find the results seem to be consistent and justify that this, this assumption is, is correct. Okay, so let me first say a little bit about the large end limit. So indeed in the large end limit, you typically expect the instantons to be suppressed. So we should get away with using the perturbative uh, expression I wrote earlier. And so let's consider for concreteness a 5D n equals one theory with USP 2N gauge group and NF less than eight hypermultiplets and an anti-symmetric hypermultiplet. So we're going to take a similar approach as Benini, Christov, and Zaffaroni, as I mentioned earlier. They argued that in the large n limit, there's a single vacuum that is, has a dominant contribution to this beta sum. And so we try to find this vacuum by taking an ansatz for the, the dominant eigenvalue u uh, in terms of uh, some arbitrary uh, scaling of with n, n to the alpha. And if we plug this, this ansatz into the twisted superpotential, we find that it is given by a functional of this form. And for these two terms to compete with each other, we should take alpha to be 1 half. And that tells us that this scales as n to the 5 halves. And in fact, this, this, um, I can, this uh, functional is essentially up to some rescalings of various parameters identical to the partition function that appears for S5, as derived by Jaffers and Pufu. And the result we find for the extremal eigenvalue density, plugging that in, the extremal twisted superpotential is given by this expression and is just proportional to the S5 free energy. And this this is an interesting relation, and an analogous relation was observed in three dimensions by Hosseini and Zaffroni. They found that the S3 free energy at large n is also proportional to the extremal value of the twisted superpotential of the 3D theory. So we find a similar statement in 5D. So now we can take this, this extremal eigenvalue configuration and plug it in to the partition function, uh, which is given by this functional here. And the result we find is, again, can be simply related to the S5 free energy, and it's given by, the, by this expression, so with some proportionality factor. Let's see what, what is the holographic interpretation of this. So this theory has a holographic description as massive type 2a gravity on uh, a warped product of ADS6 with S4. And uh, Obev and Krishigno considered uh, gauge gravity uh, minimal gauge supergravity solutions in the background of a, a two brain which interpolate between asymptotically ADS6 and the near horizon geometry of ADS4 times sigma g. So there's some solutions that interpolate between these two, um, these two behaviors and these are the holographic dual of the geometry we're considering on S3 times uh, sigma g. And so what, what they found was that the asymptotic uh, ADS4, the near horizon ADS4 radius can be related using these solutions by interpolating this, uh, these solutions to the asymptotic radius of the ADS6 with some proportionality factor. And reading off the radii of these uh, ADS4 and ADS6, this implies a universal relation between the S3 partition function of the theory compactified on sigma g and the S5 partition function with exactly the same relation that we found earlier. So we've found a field theory uh, derivation of this result that they found holographically. And this was for a particular theory, but this result can be uh, generalized to more general quiver gauge theories, and we always find the same relation holds. <laughs>
Okay, so let, let me now briefly talk about um, some 6D interpretation of some of these computations. So one interesting feature of 5D gauge theories is that there, many of them are expected to have a UV completion in terms of a 6D theory with an emergent S1 direction. Uh, so for example, the maximal N equals two super Young Mills theory uh, is secretly the uh, zero comma two theory uh, compactified on a circle. And similarly, this uh, theory that I described earlier in the case of NF equal to eight is related to the N equals zero comma one E string theory in six dimensions. And in this setup, the radius beta of this emergent S1 direction is related to the 5D gauge coupling in this way. And specifically, you can think of the KK modes as being uh, related to the instanton particles whose, whose action is proportional to one over beta. So for these theories, this partition function that we're computing is uh, secretly a partition function on S3B times S1 beta times sigma G um, for this 6D theory. And so one signature that, that this is the correct interpretation is that if we go back to this large end solution, let's consider the case of uh, the NF equals eight theory. You can see that now this term vanishes and there's an, another term which I haven't written here, but which na now the competition is between this term and this other term. And in that case, you find that the, the scaling of the twisted superpotential at large end is actually as n cubed instead of n to the five halves, which is a signature of the 60 behavior. So we can now further compactify these 60 theories on sigma g. Um, and this process procedure of taking a 60 one comma zero theory on sigma g to obtain to some 40 n equals one theories uh, is by now very well studied in many examples. So the setup is that we have some correspondence that this S3B times sigma g partition function can be secretly thought of as a 60 partition function on S3 times sigma g times S1, and which in turn is equivalent to the, the partition function of a certain 4D n equals one theory on S3B times S1, um, which is the computing the supersymmetric index of this 4D theory. And the, specifically the parameters of the 4D index are related to the parameters of, of the S3B times sigma g partition function in this way. So the, the, the rotation parameters P and Q are expressed in terms of the radius beta and the squashing parameter B. And similarly for the mass, the fugacity, flavor symmetry fugacities uh, in the index are related to the masses in 5D. So to take some examples, the uh, is very well studied the maximal theory in 5D, which uplifts to the zero comma two theory within some ADE gauge group G, uh, gives rise in 4D upon compactification to the N equals one and N equals two class S theories in 4D. And the 5D E string theory, uh, when compactified on a Riemann surface was recently studied by this group and they found a class of interesting 4D N equals one theories uh, that can be derived from this theory. Now, this tells us that in principle, these computations on S3 times sigma g are telling us about the, the supersymmetric indices of these theories, but in many cases, these theories are non-Lagrangian. And I should emphasize that these 5D theories that I've talked about do have a Lagrangian in terms of this gauge theory. And so this, in principle, gives us a way to compute the, the 4D index of these non-Lagrangian theories. There's an important caveat, which is that uh, in order to do the full computation, we need to understand the instanton corrections still work in progress. So before, below, um, I'll consider uh, a couple of special limits where we expect the instanton contributions to, to drop out. And we can relate this, we can interpret this in terms of some 40 index computation. Okay, so the first limit I'll consider is the, what I'll call the Casimir limit. So here we have, uh, we take the limit where the radius beta is, uh, which is, remember, related to the 5D gauge coupling, and we take the limit where these go to infinity. And in this limit, we expect that the 4D index is a dominant contribution only from the vacuum state, because we, we've taken a very long Euclidean evolution on, along this S1. And so the, it should be expressed in terms of the, the Casimir energy associated to the vacuum state, which I'll call E4. Now, it was argued by these people a few years, a few years ago that the this Casimir energy can be expressed in terms of an equivariant integration of the anomaly polynomial of a 4D theory. 
So schematically, we have this relation that this Casimir energy is an integral, an equivariant integral of this anomaly polynomial. But since these theories have a 60 origin, this anomaly polynomial can be derived by integrating a 60 anomaly polynomial over the Riemann surface with the appropriate fluxes inserted. And so we expect this relation to, to hold for the 4D Casimir energy. So we can try to compute the S3B times, part, times sigma G partition function in this limit. And what we find in several examples is that the beta equations drastically simplify. They become essentially linear. And uh, we find some, some leading behavior, which indeed looks like a Casimir energy behavior, proportional to the radius beta. So for example, for the n equals 2 theory, this is given by this explicit expression, uh, where this is the uh, dual Coxeter element, and this is the dimension, and depends on the various uh, flavor symmetry fugacities and fluxes. And so we get this, this behavior, but this factor that we find here is not quite E4, but it's something I'll call E pert. And we can write E4 in terms of E pert and an additional contribution, which is natural to attribute to the instantons that we've so far neglected. But actually, this instanton contribution has a very simple uh, uh, expression. Uh, namely, we can attribute this missing piece to, uh, by integrating this ano the anomaly polynomial in 60 of some free fields. So this, this extra piece can be interpreted can be uh, described explicitly in terms of some free fields, some free vectors and tensors in, in, in six dimensions. And it, precisely the same interpretation was found uh, by these people when studying the 60 theory, uh, or the 60 Casimir energy uh, in, the, in the limit of the S5 partition function. By studying the perturbative limit of the S5 partition function, they found that they were missing some pieces which were attributed to exactly uh, an analogous formula for the 60 um, fields. Okay, so the last uh, application that I'll mention is uh, that there's a, there's a certain limit. If we now focus on the n equals 2, the maximal theory, with some gauge group G, we can find a, a simplifying limit where we can, again, understand these instanton contributions or, or where they, they actually drop out. So to start, let me write the full answer, which is, again, given by this formula, which I can write explicitly in terms of some double sign functions. And here I'll, I'll mention that this flux for the Riemann surf, on, that we've inserted on the Riemann surface here for, for the flavor symmetry um, is, so this is the flavor symmetry that we have because this has extended uh, R symmetry compared to a generic n equals 1 5D theory. So inserting this flux breaks the symmetry to the n equals 1 star theory. And in 4D, this, this gives us the n equals 1 class S theories of, of these people, where at, at zero flux, this gives us the usual n equals 2 class S theories. So, the, so this partition function should compute the 4D index of general class S theories. Now, we don't know how to do this for general fugosities, but if we take this special limit here uh, for nu, uh, then it turns out that the instanton contribution essentially is trivial, it, at least is in, completely independent of the, the gauge coupling, oh, sorry, of the gauge parameter u. And in this limit, also these these double sign functions simplify to just a linear piece or an exponential piece. And so now the solutions of the beta equations can be expressed as in terms of the co-weight lattice of the gauge group. So they're just proportional to the weights, to the co-weights, which can in turn be identified with the ir irreducible representations of G. So we find that in this limit, the S3 times sigma G partition function is written as a sum over the representations of G of some factors which are obtained by simplifying this expression in this limit which are just polynomials in P and Q, uh, which are called the uh, quantum dimension of the representation R. And this formula, which we find in this limit, precisely agrees with the corresponding limits of the 4D index of these n equals 2 and n equals 1 theories as derived by these people. So this gives us a hint that this partition function that we're computing is indeed computing the 4D index of these theories. OK, so let me conclude. So to summarize, uh, I've tried to convince you that it's very useful to, to understand these higher dimensional partition functions by reducing to 2D TQFTs. Um, these are often controlled by a very small amount of data, specifically the twisted superpotential, uh, which can be computed explicitly. And this gives many interesting new probes of, of dualities, and in particular holographic dualities. And in the second part of the talk, I, I told you about a computation in 5D 
using this perspective, which, tell, which can, in principle, teach us a lot about 5D and even 4D and 6D QFTs. So as far as some uh, future directions to explore, so I think there are many other interesting dualities we can apply this to. In particular, one example would be the 3D, 3D correspondence. Um, I didn't say much about the surface operators, but in principle, we know, how to, we know their algebra uh, using this, this uh, A model perspective, and so it would be interesting to apply this to study these operators in more detail. An obvious direction that we're working on in the 5D computation is to understand the full instanton corrected partition function, which can help us study these 5D theories, and in particular, these 4D non-Lagrangian theories. And finally, it would be interesting to study to understand the interpretation of these results in the context of integrable systems. And there are many known relations between the 4D index of, of, certain, uh, of certain n equals 1 theories and integrable systems, and perhaps we can understand that in this context. And finally, to mention a few applications to holography, so we can try to find some new holographic RG flows to understand the relation uh, between these partition functions in different dimensions, like the example I, I showed earlier between uh, 5D and 3D to understand the subleading corrections in 1 over n, and finally, to understand hologra holographically in the bulk these, what is the way to think about these, these local operators which change the geometry. Uh, in the field theory, it's, it's, uh, we understand why the partition functions take the simple form that they do, but I think in, in the bulk, this is still mysterious, and it would be nice to understand. So I'll stop there. Thanks.